Now, I know I spend a lot of time on my podcast talking about my doctorate, but this is another story about my doctorate, and specifically, it's about why my doctorate took seven years of research when most doctorates take about three years. Now, typically in a PhD, a doctorate will do a piece of original research, and they'll take a few classes, and that'll take them about three years in order to complete that piece of work. I didn't do that, needless to say. Um, I didn't even do a traditional PhD. What I actually have a degree uh, in is, it's called a Doctor of Philosophy. Um, And I know that sounds probably strange and weird because that's what also a PhD is. But if you Google Dr. Philos and put a Scandinavian country in there like Norway, Denmark or Sweden, you'll get some results that are more specifically focused on the degree that I got. And I'll describe a little bit about what the main differences are. Um, So a PhD, what you typically have is a supervisor, some classes, a piece of research that you do. Again, wrap it up in about three years. Uh, I had none of that. I had the piece of research, but all the work that I went into it was done independently, without a supervisor, with no classwork required, uh, and with no real structured curriculum. So I didn't have the same basis for doing my research as a lot of academics do when they're first starting off. Now, it was during my master's degree that I decided that academia is what I wanted to pursue. I had this vision of wanting to do a doctorate and going into academia, becoming a researcher, becoming a teacher, and whatever else came across my plate. And this was born out of a longer period of my life where I thought that what I wanted to be was a scientist, going all the way back into my childhood. But it certainly kind of came to a peak whenever I finished my master's degree and I started looking for jobs. And I was only looking for academic positions. So I was working in the tech sector at the time. I could have looked for tech jobs, but I didn't. I said, I want to make the change and I want to go into academia. And so I was looking for every possible academic kind of job, whether it was research assistant, project manager, coordinator, or anything like that, on up to uh, PhD, research fellowships, and things like that. Now, when I finally accepted a job here in Oslo, Norway, to come here and start doing research on this topic of universal design, I uh, got on a plane, came here, and had no idea what I was doing. I had little to no knowledge about what universal design was, what it entailed, what were the implications. I came here with a very, very open mind and a rather empty mind as well. Uh, But it wasn't too long after a first year or so that I really started embracing the concept and looking into the uh, scientific traditions of the field, reading everything I could about it, and then moving beyond just reading, actually taking action, going into the field and collecting data on this issue and on this uh, topic to try to understand a little bit more in depth what is the uh, key uh, findings, what are the key knowledge areas that are important in uh, in this area. Now, that got me started, but it wasn't where I ended up. So I, uh, doing that data collection, trying to find an initial survey and just kind of really laying the foundation for what would come later was only an initial step. The next big juncture was actually going beyond just reading and talking to a few people about it and moving into more targeted opportunities for collaboration, dialogue, and dissemination. And what that amounted to is that I would go to seminars and conferences, present my early, the earliest stages of my research, of my data collection, to try to get feedback from the experts that were in the room, to try to get some knowledge from what they had experienced in order to better inform the work that I was doing. And I think it was really, really successful because it gave me a chance to reflect on my work to bring in much more interdisciplinary perspectives into that field and not to kind of feel isolated in my research Because again, I was doing all of this independently, so it wasn't as if I had a chance to kind of bounce ideas off of people very often. There were people at my workplace that I was lucky enough who would talk to me about my research, but they weren't 
people who would take that same role that a supervisor normally would take. It was much more informal and it was much more uh, kind of organic the way it evolved, the way those relationships evolved. And so in that process, I kind of went from a lot more of a superficial understanding of my topic to a much more in-depth understanding of my topic because it gave me that chance for reflection. It gave me that chance for deeper understanding of the critical issues in my field. And that then formed a strong basis for going back out into the field and doing more data collection. But this time I was able to get at the critical issues that were at stake, not just uh, on a superficial level, but actually digging in deep to uncover new findings and try to find and make new discoveries about the field that I was, uh, that I was researching. Now, once I had gained that more in-depth understanding and I had discovered some new areas of the field that previously hadn't been kind of presented in the scientific literature, it gave me a chance to start publishing. And I published like mad. Over the course of a few years, I was putting out five, six, seven, eight, nine articles a year, really trying to kind of flood the uh, academic publication market with the ideas that I had gathered from my uh, data collection. And so it gave me that chance to kind of parse out the data in a way where there was one critical finding published with each article. And uh, in that process, then it also gave me the foundation to begin applying for funding and eventually getting awarded funding for the research that I was doing. So it was again, this critical juncture in my career, where I went from being knowledgeable about a topic, gaining expertise in a topic to publishing that expertise and establishing myself as a leader in the field to then working to find ways of drawing in resources to help continue to uh, push the envelope in this area in this topic that I was researching. And still, after all of this effort, I had not attained my doctorate yet. And the time between when I first moved to Norway to start studying for my doctorate, to start my research towards my doctorate, and to the time that I submitted my first manuscript of my, uh, of my doctorate was seven years. And uh, it was an absolutely amazing experience because I kind of got to, to create my own path. I got to walk down the roads that I thought were most important. I got to explore the areas of my topic that I thought were critically, uh, critically important. And uh, it gave me a chance to, and gave me the space to really uh, kind of flesh out the field of study in a way that I don't think a three-year uh, PhD program would have allowed me to do. Now, once I had that manuscript together and I submitted it, uh, it was again this kind of waiting game to hopefully get feedback from the reviewers and hopefully that feedback was positive and I would be able to go on and defend my, uh, defend my doctorate. Uh, but it wasn't. Uh, I had gotten a rejection right off the bat and uh, the reviewers provided pages and pages of comments saying, this needs to be improved and this needs to be improved and this needs to be adapted and you need to explain further here and there. And uh, it was discouraging, uh, I won't lie. It, it took me back and I had to kind of reset myself and think more critically about the work that I was doing and even to kind of find the energy and really dig deep to make those corrections and resubmit. Uh, it was also, uh, the stakes were even higher on this resubmission because uh, in the Doctor of Philos programs, you are only allowed to submit one additional time. So you can make a submission and you get comments back uh, and then you can make one final submission and that's the only time you're allowed to do it. So this was, uh, this was kind of a make or break situation and I took a month or two, I made those revisions and I said to myself, there's just nothing more I can do in this area. I have seven years of research under my belt I had a massive amount of publications by then. I had grant funding from different uh, research uh, funders. 
but I didn't have that credential. And so I made that final submission and I just kind of hoped that things would work out. And a few months later, I was sitting on the bus and I think I was going to a doctor's appointment and I got that message from the University of Bergen in Norway saying that my doctor, uh, my doctoral thesis had been approved for defense and that at this point the only thing standing in my way was the defense. And I broke down right there on the bus and uh, I cried. I cried like a baby. And I called my partner and I was bawling on the phone and I'm sure everybody on the bus was staring at me. And uh, she thought that was some kind of horrendous accident. And so I had to choke through my tears and explain to her that my doctoral thesis had been approved for defense and that uh, a few weeks later I would be going to Bergen and defending my thesis. And that was a seven-year journey that uh, I don't think I would trade for anything else. Uh, I've always been a bit non-traditional in my academic pursuits, and I've always been a very independent student. And so I think this was a great opportunity for me in my academic career to uh, kind of put a cap on my work uh, by doing something I'm truly proud of. And uh, I think one of the things that I can uh, thank or one of the things that I can attribute the success to is that Norway has a program for doing an independent doctoral thesis. Uh, and it's exactly as I describe. It's you do a bunch of research on your own, you draft a manuscript for your dissertation, and you submit it to one of the universities in Norway. There are some other eligibility requirements in there, and you can find all kinds of information online. But if I hadn't had that opportunity, I would have never gotten my doctorate. So I think this is a really important uh, point of reflection in this story. Now, the uh, takeaway here is one of simple persistence. Uh, I, wouldn't, I could not have told you at the start of my research for my doctorate that it would have taken me seven years. And chances are, if, I would have, if somebody would have told me it would have taken seven years, I might not have actually gone down that road. I might have actually chosen a different kind of career. But having gone down that road and having made my own way, I uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. So my call to action here is to reflect on the road that you're on. Uh, it might seem like the uh, destination is far, far off in the distance, and that's okay. Or maybe the destination seems really, really close, and that's okay too. Uh, but really search within yourself and try to understand what is it about the process that you love the most.